For a few years there, Omega and Chat Roulette were like the best things ever. I know it sounds dumb, but the idea of coming face to face with random internet people absolutely terrified me at first. I wasn't the most confident of people when I was younger and, believe it or not, using stuff like Omega actually helped me come out of my show a little and learn how to talk to people. And naturally, like anyone who spent a lot of time on Omega, I have a lot of stories detailing some of the weirder encounters I've had on there. I mean, I've had some pretty amazing ones. I met one of my long-term gaming buddies on Omega, and you'd be surprised at the number of girls who just want to show themselves off, so to speak, every once in a while. But I've also had my share of gross, sad, irritating, and downright scary encounters on Omega too. And what I'm about to tell you is by far the most disturbing. And it's not some dumb creepypasta either. Every word of this is true. So I'd just gotten home from this terrible part-time job I was working in 2012, and at the time, my routine was like, get home, sneak one of my stepdad's beers from the garage, and see how palpable the mental illness was on Omega that afternoon. I was actually having a good run at one point. I had a guy singing that Call Me Maybe song, another dude who did a magic trick and a handful of pretty girls, and I think one dude was on acid or something. So all in all, I was in a pretty good mood by the time I hit end and knew for what turned out to be the final time of that night. Because when I do, I just see this dude sitting at his desk, staring blankly into the webcam. Immediately this hits me as unusual because most people are looking at their screens to see who you are and not straight up staring into the camera. I said like, hey, what's up? Or something. But the dude didn't reply, so I figured that there was just something wrong with his audio. Now I should add that it was usually around this time that I'd just end a chat and start a new one. If the person on the other end seemed too weird or like they wouldn't be much fun, I'd just skip them entirely. So as you can imagine, coupled with all the other weird stuff you're likely to see during an Omega session, I ended up doing a lot of skipping. But something about this dude really got my attention. At first, when I saw him, he looked like he might be in his early to mid-teens, dark hair and eyes, kind of a baby face with scrawny shoulders. But the more I looked, the older he seemed to be. The guy had crow's feet, deep bags under his eyes, pretty sure he had flecks of gray at his temples too. Like if he was as young as I thought he was, then he must have had the most brutal paper route in history. So for some reason, at a time I'd normally just ghost him, I said, uh, are you okay, dude? Can you hear me? He nods. He could hear me, and it hit me that this might be another case of someone browsing Omega while they're high. It might sound a little mean or whatever, but I figured that I'd just mess with him just a little bit. Maybe see if I could guess what kind of drug he was taking. I start talking real slow to him, trying to make him think time is slowing down or something, but he barely reacts. And it's then that I realized that he hasn't looked at his screen or monitor. The whole time, he was literally just staring at this little lens on his webcam. I break from the play acting and just ask him straight up, What kind of stuff are you on, dude? He just shakes his head. So I ask him if he means he isn't on any drugs at all, and to that he nods. Now I'm torn between laughing because of what could have been a blatant lie and kind of freaking out because if he wasn't lying, and that was him sober, that made for one real creepy guy. And then out of nowhere, this guy reaches up towards his mouth like he's about to take out some gum or something. At first, I think he's going to show me some weird root he's been chewing on that made him look all sleepy. I mean, if there is such a thing, I was just kind of speculating. I know people can get some pretty weird South American plants and stuff from shady websites. But then it becomes obvious that he has hold of his own tooth. His front tooth, I think. Like in the grip of his thumb and forefinger. And then he starts to pull. I respond. Dude, what are you doing? All calm at first. And then he starts really getting a grip on his tooth. Pulling it and twisting it. And I respond... Uh, stop! What are you thinking, man? This all escalates until I hear like a deep cracking sound coming from this guy's mic. 
He twists the tooth free from his gum as blood starts to pour out of his mouth, then holds it up to the camera like he's all proud of himself. I am full on squealing at the computer at this point, stuck between wanting to cover my eyes and turn it off, and not being able to look away because of what this guy is even doing. I asked him, in like a hundred different ways, Why did you do that? Was it rotten? Can't you go to the dentist? He doesn't say a word. He just spends a few more seconds smiling with this gap-toothed grin, mopping at the blood on his chin and holding up the tooth in front of the webcam. Then he disappears and I'm left on the new chat screen, just shell-shocked. Nothing has ever topped that for me in terms of just pure creepiness. Like I have so many unanswered questions about that guy, and each time I think I get close to figuring it out, it just opens me up to a hundred other questions. I mean, he would have had to have been on drugs to be able to pull his own tooth out like that. I don't think anyone could stand the sheer agony. And it's also the whole idea that it wasn't his first time doing it. As crazy as it sounds, he seemed to just know what he was doing. That he had to twist it and wrench it. He knew exactly how to grip it. And then the sense of pride at the end. It all just gave me this distinct feeling that he'd done that kind of thing before. I didn't see anything else that ever made me react so strongly and after that... All the random guys just sort of playing with their junk that you'd see didn't seem to faze me at all. Like as long as there wasn't any tooth pulling, it was just water off the duck's back. So, I guess I have something to thank Mr. Tooth Puller for, although saying that it's not something I want to see again. In fact, I hope I never meet Mr. Tooth Puller online, or in real life, ever again. Back when my daughter was 12, her father and I made the huge mistake of not properly vetting her internet access. We had all the sites you might expect to be blocked by certain providers automatically filtered out, but there were lots of sites that kind of fell through the cracks. That's how Emma managed to get herself into a horrible situation when she was surfing the internet one evening when she came across a website called Omegle. From what she told me, it's a website that randomly pairs people up who can then chat by either typing or talking to each other with their webcams. I get why meeting new people might be fun, but I also understood that certain bad actors tend to use these kinds of things too. Because one night she came into the living room in a flood of tears. I mean, she was inconsolable. Hadn't cried like that since she was a little girl. Her father and I asked her what the matter was and it took her quite a while to compose herself enough to tell us. For a good few minutes... She seemed to get just on the verge of being able to say what it was and then just burst into tears all over again. When she finally told us, we understood why. I had expected her to have a falling out with a friend, maybe even broken one of her favorite toys, but when I heard what had happened, our jaws dropped. In her own childish way, she explained that a man had tried to groom her on the internet using this website called Omegle. She told us that she'd been too freaked out to turn the computer on and sat there in horror while this complete pervert did things to himself right there on his bed. Only after a few minutes did she find it in herself to switch the thing off at the wall and come running downstairs to us. We made a huge deal out of it, told her it wasn't her fault, called the police so she could give a description of the guy, anything and everything to make her feel better about what had happened. She seemed down in the dumps for a few days and... She stayed off the computer for almost two weeks afterwards, but in the end she seemed to get over it pretty quickly, and her father and I were definitely happy about that, even if the whole thing definitely left us very concerned. Cut to about three months later, and we're taking a trip down to Florida to visit my husband's parents. We make something of a road trip out of it every year, and one of our little rituals when we're on the way down there is to stop at this little roadside Mexican place that does the most amazing tacos. So, we're at our favorite taco place, sitting outside to soak up some sun, and my daughter says she's going to use the bathroom. She gets up, goes inside the restaurant, and leaves my husband and I alone to eat. Less than a minute later, 
she comes running back out looking like she's seen a ghost. We ask her what the matter was and her only response is, I saw him. From the way she was acting, there was only one him that she could have possibly been talking about. But at first I'm thinking that it can't possibly be the same guy that had done that to her earlier just so happening to be hanging out at our traditional roadside taco place. I asked her where she'd seen him and she said he was just sitting at the bar and that they'd actually exchanged a glance as she was walking by. My husband goes in to check it out and get a measure of the guy because, no offense, but I know Emma was really shaken up about it and there's no telling if it was just trauma bubbling up after months of repressing it. She might have just been seeing things, I thought. Only now I realize that's just what I wanted it to be and not the reality of the situation before us. My husband then returns from inside the restaurant looking really stony-faced. He said he didn't like the look of the guy at the bar at all, and that he matched the description our daughter had given the police to a T. After hearing that her father believed that it could really be the same guy, our daughter starts freaking out. I can tell she's trying her best to keep it together, and she did a really great job of it too, but she was controlling her breathing pretty hard and I could tell she was at a breaking point. She wanted to just get out of there, and we all started walking to the car when my husband pipes up that he needed to go back inside to pay the check. So for not even three minutes, my daughter and me were stood by our car alone. And in that time, the pervy guy must have slipped past my husband without him seeing because the next thing I know, my daughter sobs out and audible. Oh my god, mom. I look up, and there he is staring at my daughter from across the parking lot. You think the guy might just play it cool when a girl's parents were around and he probably did think that we were alone, having not realized my husband was with us. But there he was, bold as brass, letching over my daughter across that parking lot and he was smiling too. I get out my phone, showing it to him like, do I need to call the cops here? I think I'd have been angrier if I wasn't so terrified too. I doubted my daughter at first and I felt terrible for that, I still do. But after seeing the look in that man's eyes when he stared at her, I believed her. I believed it was really him. My wordless threat to call someone didn't even make him flinch. He just carried on staring and smiling. I swear he was about to start walking over to us when I realized my husband reappeared from the taco place and basically chased him off. We were okay in the end, and we called the cops anyway to give a very long-winded statement about what had happened over the past six months. They'd said they looked into it, but we don't hold out any hope of them catching the guy. I do still wonder sometimes, though, what that day would have been like if my husband had been around to chase that guy away. He was a predator, plain and simple. I could see it in his eyes. And if he'd had gotten his hands on my daughter and I, I probably wouldn't be here writing this now. I just wonder, how did he find her? Was it pure coincidence? Or did he go out of his way to stalk her? One time me and a mate of mine was webcamming with random people on that Omegle site when we came across this one bloke who was actually injecting heroin, wanting to basically show anyone who would watch him how he did it. Apparently we were the first people to actually stick around and talk to him. Most other people closed the chat window as soon as they saw that he had a needle, but I suppose we were just morbidly curious as to how someone actually takes it. Like we'd seen it in films and stuff, but... To see it actually happening, that was a different kind of feeling entirely. So as the guy is like getting his hit in a spoon, boiling it up with some kind of citric acid so it melted faster, we ask him why he was choosing to broadcast his drug use online. He says he's not long been out of prison, and that he was about to piss away 18 months of sobriety, so he might as well turn it into a bit of a spectacle and educate some people in the process. I mean... I'd never say I respected a junkie or anything. They can be some really scummy people, but I... I don't know. The balls of the guy to just broadcast it to anyone who'd watch. I suppose I had a kind of weird respect for that. 
The guy had his laptop next to him on the couch, and he's doing all his junky stuff on the coffee table in front of me while he's guiding us through the process. And then the time comes when he's got a needle full of this juice stuff and tied his arm off with a belt, and he's about to shoot up. Now unlike the films, the fella didn't just keel over right away and become totally unresponsive straight away, it was like this slow descent. At first, he was fine, just talking away, sniffing and working his elbow to make the drug circulate faster. And then, like a minute later, his eyelids are drooping. He's going all pale. He's not responding to our questions anymore. Me and my mate were just watching this like, whoa. It was kind of a rush at first, if I'm honest. Like we knew we were watching something that we shouldn't be. We were seeing something forbidden. Eventually he does just sort of pass out, only he's still kind of making noises like he was trying to talk, so I guess he was in kind of like some type of stupor. He's totally silent, leaning back into the couch, head back, and he's breathing fine, but he looks terrible. Only then he does start groaning and kind of wincing a little bit. We ask him if he's alright, but we don't get a response. He just slowly starts sliding onto his side, groaning the whole time. And that's when it hit us. I think he was having an overdose. And by the time he was actually lying on his side on the couch, his breathing sounded terrible. He was making these noises that sounded like snoring and wheezing mixed together, and that's about the time me and my mate started to properly freak out. We start shouting at him over webcam, telling him to wake up, asking him where he lived, but we got nothing. He was totally unconscious. Not just that, he was dying. We couldn't call 999, we had no idea what his name was or where he lived, and that was out of the question. My mate suggested getting his IP address or something and I had absolutely no idea how I'd go about something like that, but I googled it anyway, and in this mad panic we tried and failed to find a way to get this guy's IP, slowly realizing that there was just nothing we could do for him. I even found out later that even if we did get his IP, it wouldn't have really helped. It would just show a rough location and not like an exact address. I just remember sitting there, head in hands, listening to this guy's breathing getting weaker and weaker until I just couldn't listen to it anymore. I just made this sudden decision to simply close the chat window. It was nothing to do with us. We didn't make that bloke do anything. We didn't make him put that stuff in his arm. But even then, closing that chat window just felt like I'd killed him myself. We were this bloke's last lifeline and I still sort of feel like we just gave up on him too soon. It didn't keep me off Omegle, like I still went on it from time to time after we saw that, a little because I hoped that we'd see that bloke alive and well, even if he was still using drugs. But I didn't see anything that crazy or scary ever again and thank god I haven't either. I definitely couldn't handle seeing something like that, ever again. I've been matched with quite a few memorable people on Omegle. It's just the law of averages that if you spend enough time on that site, you're going to meet some pretty interesting folks. Interesting for good reasons and interesting for bad ones sometimes too. The one that by far sticks out the most in my mind had nothing to do with guys waving their junk around and isn't even necessarily the craziest, but it had some pretty serious ramifications to my actual offline life. You'll see what I mean in a moment. So I ended up talking to this good looking guy who seemed pretty cool at first, until he just casually slid it into the conversation that he was a functioning psychopath. I thought he was just screwing with me at first, so I laughed the comment off. But he actually went into a lot of detail as to how and when he was diagnosed and assured me that he wasn't playing around. I still didn't quite believe him, like he thinks psychopath and you picture Hannibal Lecter or something. This guy was quite charming, polite, articulate. It just didn't add up for me at first. It wasn't until I asked him about what it was like growing up with psychopathy that I really began to understand what his deal was. How he just didn't relate to people emotionally growing up. How he'd see other kids get excited or upset over something and just kind of cringe over it because he couldn't imagine feeling anything like that himself. 
Then he started telling me about how he'd learned to blend, as he put it. And that was the first point I actually started getting a little freaked out. He talked about how he knew he was different, from quite an early age too, and had basically learned to mimic other people's mannerisms and emotional patterns in order to fit in. The whole time he's talking, he's smiling, occasionally chuckling at some funny metaphor he'd used to explain something, but I started to see what he was talking about. His mouth was doing one thing, but his eyes just weren't following along. It sounds crazy now that I'm trying to write it down, but I hope I managed to actually explain this properly. But it was like he couldn't hide what he was feeling in his eyes, and from what I could tell, there was just nothing there. Nothing behind them. Not a hint of genuine emotion. Now I feel like it's at this point that I should explain something that'll have what follows make a little bit more sense. I used the video chat on Omegle, but I also made my webcam face whatever art piece I was working on at the time. It made for a good conversation starter sometimes and I enjoyed the compliments I got. The point being, no one could see my face, but from my voice they'd know that I was a girl. I didn't ever show this guy what it looked like and weirdly enough, he didn't seem all that interested in me that way either. But the anonymity made it so I was comfortable asking him weirder and weirder things with basically no repercussions. So when I say I asked him if he'd ever thought about hurting people, you get that I did so under the pretense of being totally safe to do so. This guy was probably on the other side of the country. Our paths would never cross, no harm, no foul. I didn't quite know what to expect when I asked him, like he was defying my every explanation so far. I had every reason to believe that he'd never thought about hurting people, like he'd have to actually be interested in them at first, right? But unfortunately, this was one of the few ways in which the guy actually did seem like a psychopath, because right there with his face showing on webcam, he admitted to fantasizing about hurting people. It wasn't even people that had wronged him or made him angry either. The way he explained it, if he went around killing everyone that had ever done him wrong, then he'd be a suspect in the murders. And psychopath or no psychopath, he certainly did not want to go to prison. When I asked him why he wanted to hurt people, he told me it was because they deserved it. That people were irritating to him and it would probably do the world some good if there were less of us around. He'd said he put a great deal of thought into it and the way he'd planned it out in his head was this. He'd go out one night, pick someone walking on their own, and just bash them in the side of the head with a hammer before getting back to his apartment ASAP. Just bam, job done, don't leave a trace. It was a horrifically cold and calculated plan. Nothing too elaborate, just functional. I then asked him why he didn't want to see his potential victim suffer, why his chosen method of murder seemed so devoid of depravity or whatever. He told me torture was messy. He'd get a lot of them on him and live little pieces of himself at the scene too. Not only that, but he said the idea of seeing someone beg for their life would be the most awkward thing ever, that he'd be super embarrassed for them. Picture that. Someone in tears begging you not to kill them, and all you feel is like, ugh, cringe. He then started talking about how he hated the idea of the Hollywood serial killer, that a handful of trophy-taking cannibals had captured the public imagination. They all wanted to make human skin lampshades out of you after they ate your liver, but he said he didn't need trophies. He didn't want fame or some cool nickname that'll become the title of a movie they make about him. Just knowing he'd killed, or at least knowing he'd given someone life-changing injuries from the acute head trauma, that was enough for him. That would be what kept him warm at night. By that point, I'm suitably convinced that I'm talking to an actual real-life psychopath, and it gives me a weird mix of feelings. That it's incredible that the internet can connect us with such bizarre examples of our fellow humans, but also that I felt deeply uncomfortable having talked this guy's fantasy out with him. Like at no point did I actually stop him and say, You've a twisted view of the world. I just sort of acted like this guy's therapist, which I most definitely wasn't. It was then that I made the point of telling him that he better not be thinking of actually hurting anyone, because it'd be a shame to have to turn him into the police. A kind of joke that's not a joke type thing. He laughs and agrees that they're feelings he'd never act on. 
and that just randomly talking to people online about it helps him put things into perspective, but then adds a creepy little addendum that if it wasn't for the internet, all those feelings might have just bottled up and he'd be forced to take them out. It was creepy comments like that which killed the vibe for me. I started to see the guy as less of a curiosity and more for what he was, a genuine creep who was just making excuses for why he wanted to hurt people. So I chose to end it there, but not before being polite enough to actually tell him I was leaving. He'd been polite enough to give me an insight into his condition, even if it did make me hate him for it, and the least I could do was actually say goodbye. He didn't seem sad that I was leaving. He just carried on smiling, that creepy forced smile he kept on for the entire conversation was like, okay, no worries. But he did kind of shift in his chair and lean over at one point, maybe to pick something up off of a side table. I don't know exactly why, but it gave me a look at the view of the outside of his room. I remember weirdly recognizing something about the facade of the building I could see out of the window, thinking for a moment that it seemed oddly like the facade on the one I lived in. But it wasn't until a few minutes after I closed the chat window that it really sunk in. I had to go outside and look again just to be certain, but there it was. The exact same pattern I'd seen. And lo and behold, there was another set of apartment buildings just to the rear of the one I was in. The guy I'd been talking to. The guy who admitted to me that he fantasized about coldly and randomly murdering people in the street. He lived less than a football field away from me. In fact, I was pretty sure I could guess exactly which apartment was his too, at least within a couple of units. That was without a doubt one of the single most terrifying moments of my entire life, and in a weird twist of logic I found myself wishing I had shown him my face, so that if or when he finally did decide to just snap and crack someone's skull open with a claw hammer, he might actually show me a measure of mercy. But luckily I never saw the guy around the neighborhood and... I didn't hear of any random hammer attacks ever happening, so I'm guessing the guy stayed on top of his urges. But that made life around that area pretty frightening for a while, just knowing a guy like that was out there. And I suppose there's people like that all over the place, hiding in plain sight, just trying not to act upon their darkest desires. The worst thing that's ever happened to me involved a website called Omegle. I was really shy back when I was a junior in high school. I had lots of anxiety and not so many friends. Not through any fault of my own though. My parents used to move around a lot for work so every so often we'd just pick up sticks and move someplace new. This played absolute havoc on my social development for a while and by the time I joined this new school during my junior year... I not only couldn't find the confidence to speak to people, I just didn't want to either. Like what was the point when I was probably just going to move somewhere else within 12 months? But saying that, I also craved social interaction. I wanted it so bad, but just had no idea how to get it in any way that didn't turn me into a nervous wreck. And that's when I found Omegle. At first I only ever used the text option. There was no way I was going to put myself on webcam for some total stranger to see. I talked to random internet people about politics, video games, pretty much anything, and after a while, I really started to feel myself kind of coming out of my shell. And it wasn't just text chatting with people online. The thing that did it was being able to learn to take rejection. Every so often on Omegle, someone would get bored and just ghost me. Maybe they didn't like the conversation... Maybe they didn't like me. Whatever it was, they just up and disappear. First few times it happened after a decent amount of conversation, it really got to me. Total anonymity brought out some really cruel sides to people, but it somehow also brought out the best in them too. I'd have some real heart-to-hearts with complete and utter strangers, work out complex issues I had with myself. Together we'd set the world to rights, and when it was over, poof gone. I'd never talk to them again. I ended up talking to a handful of girls on Omegle too. At least, they told me they were girls. Either way, I got a flutter of excitement the first few times. A couple of them asked if I wanted to talk dirty, but 
I ended up leaving those chats on account of just not being proficient in it. Like I wanted to, but I just couldn't. Anyway, I kind of got over the novelty of it after a while. Hearing that someone was female became kind of a non-issue for me. It was pointless trying to practice talking to them online anyway. I knew I'd freeze up if we ever met in person. But it did happen once more for me. That kind of butterflies in your tummy feeling after talking to some random stranger for like an hour and a half one night. We didn't talk about one particular thing. We talked about everything. And this long, rolling, intense conversation that was as intelligent as it was amusing. I was actually pretty sure the person was a guy given some of the hobbies they claimed to have, so you can imagine how surprised I was when they said they were a girl. I was kind of speechless. Only once had I ever gotten the inkling to actually ask someone for their personal contact info so we could keep the conversation going, and that person had ghosted as soon as I asked. I wasn't about to risk any more of my pride like that again, especially when I was certain that this girl in particular would make all the rejection pain come flooding back all anew. So anyways, I find out they're a girl, get excited, but choose to basically ignore it. Not only was I sticking to my never fully believe someone online is a girl until you hear their voice or see a verification picture or video rule, but I really could feel myself getting overly excited that this was actually a girl. Like if it was a girl, then she was like my dream girl and that wasn't something I thought I could face right then, as weird as that might sound. So I keep the conversation going like it had been and suddenly I find myself actually kind of flirting. I was probably doing it really bad, but for the first time in my entire teenage years, flirting was something that actually felt sort of natural. The whole thing was going so well that after we happened to both name Ernest Hemingway's For Whom the Bell Tolls is our favorite book, I just thought, screw it, and asked if she wanted to talk over webcam. If it was a dude pretending, or she wasn't who she said she was, then fine, I'd cut my losses. But if she was... We tried to line up a little text countdown to us flicking on our webcams, which ended up being goofy and incredibly inaccurate, but it was still kind of cute and helped me get rid of what little anxiety I had left. And when I saw her, wow, she was gorgeous. Legit one of the prettiest girls I'd ever seen to this day. And after some initial blushing and awkwardness, we carried on our conversation like it was the most natural thing in the world. Her name was Emily, and I've never crushed on a girl as hard as her ever. We spent like another two hours just chatting like that, and the whole time I was terrified of getting disconnected or something. But I was still way too scared to ask for like a phone number or email or something, so I was just kind of stuck in limbo like that for a while until I could summon up the courage. She was a senior who lived a few states away, but that didn't bother me. So I tried to push the conversation towards relationships and whatnot, which gave me a way into asking her if she's single. She replies that she is single, but she might not be for long because she met this really cute guy. Obviously, I'm kind of disappointed to hear that, and I tell her I think whoever he is, he's a lucky guy. She starts laughing and says, I was talking about you, idiot. And I think if I'd blushed any harder, I've gotten a full body pins and needles and everything but my face. By the time I regain my composure, I know the time is right to ask for her number. So, I think of a smooth way to ask her, one that's witty but genuine, then work up to nailing the delivery. When I think I see something in the window behind her, only it's light in her bedroom and dark outside, so I can't exactly see what it is. I ask if she lives with her parents... She confirms she does. Then I ask if it's on a ground floor apartment and she says no, that it was a two-story and that her bedroom was on the first floor. And that's when I start to worry. Because if she lived on the second floor, why did I think I could see what looked like a face just hovering in her window like that? And how do you even tell someone that, oh, we're having this awesome conversation and I'm just going to be a jerk by telling you there's a face in your window, even though I'm not 100% sure of anything. I carry on staring at the dark shape for a second or two, trying to make sure it's not just my eyes or my monitor playing tricks on me. Emily obviously noticed my change in expression and asked me if everything is okay. I'm like, uh, sure, I just thought I saw something. 
She turns around, looks blatantly at the window and then tells me there's nothing there. Probably just a smudge on my monitor or something. I look again. It's just black so I put it down to all the adrenaline going through me and just assume I made a mistake. The conversation carries on for a while, then the same thing happens. I'm so sure that I see movement in the window behind her that I actually do just sort of snap and say, Yeah, I think there's something outside your window. She looks outside again, laughs and says, Oh, you mean that big branch out there? Yeah, we have a tree in our front yard and it's windy all the time, it's probably just that. We laugh and it breaks the tension, but... It also sidetracks my move to ask for her number, so I decide to work up to it again. But right when I get there, right when I'm about to be like, so, what's your phone number? I see movement yet again, just over her shoulder. Only this time, it's really obviously the window behind her, opening. Like I could see the white bars shifting really slowly behind her, and I knew well that it was no tree branch and that my eyes were definitely not playing tricks on me. That time I wasn't chill or suggestive about it. I just straight up shouted, Emily! The window! She then spins around to see exactly what I can see, which is a person wearing dark clothing climbing in through the open window. The webcam on her laptop was super low resolution, so I couldn't see much apart from Emily just disappearing from the camera as she screamed and ran out of the room only to be followed by this dark figure chasing her at speed. I just had to sit there and listen to the most horrific screaming and shouting sounds I've ever heard. She was home alone at the time, so there was just one set of female screams and occasionally this rough bark of the guy who was chasing her. Then all of a sudden there was a really high-pitched wail before everything went deathly quiet. I grabbed my phone and called 911 frantically, not even thinking that I had absolutely nothing to tell the dispatcher other than, I I think I'm witnessing a home invasion. I didn't know where Emily lived other than that she was in New Hampshire. I had no last name, no specifics whatsoever that could actually lead the cops to her location. In the end, I got so frustrated that I hung up. There was nothing I could do. I just stared at the webcam images of her empty bedroom praying she was okay. I'm not sure how long I was sat there, so I couldn't tell if the cops showed up quickly or not, only that they did show up. I knew because I heard the sirens before I saw the flashing lights from the window of Emily's room. I heard them break into the house, then I heard them shouting stuff like, police show me your hands and other garbled stuff, and I actually heard gunshots, maybe 15 to 20 in all. It's hard to say for certain, but it was a lot. I actually stayed on camera until I could get a cop's attention and told them that I'd seen the guy breaking in. This ended up with me getting a call from a New Hampshire detective, but once I told them that I'd only seen one person break in and that's all I'd seen via the webcam, he pretty much lost interest. Then I asked if Emily was okay. He sighed and I could hear him putting on his professional voice before he even really spoke. I'm sorry to have to tell you this one, kid but Emily passed away this morning after you two spoke. I'm deeply sorry for your loss, but be safe in the knowledge that any information you give me will go towards catching the guy who did this to her. Not exactly what he said, but you get the idea. I figured it was just a robber, someone who wanted to subdue her before he emptied the house of valuables, but he killed her. The guy did things to her, and then he killed her. He didn't even run once he'd done it either. He stuck around to carry on doing things to her until the cops showed up to shoot him when he must have rushed them or something. Must have had a weapon. For days afterwards, I searched the internet for articles about a New Hampshire murder and home invasion and God help me, I found one. And that's why I know so much about the details of what had happened and how this was about six or seven years ago and they still haven't caught the guy who did it. I do have hope, as must her family, because guys are getting caught years later when the cops get a lucky DNA match or something, but given how much I got so attached to Emily in that short period of time, knowing that there was so much special spark between us, and then hearing her final scream, 
That's been something that's messed with me for years. And I still take anti-anxiety medication all this time later. I think my time using a megal was like the golden years of my social life because now I'm back to just not getting close to people. Not because I can't or I don't want to. This time it's because I just don't have it in me to form meaningful attachments. But I know just how easily people can be taken away from us. Y'all remember that thing Omegle? I don't know if it's still as popular as it used to be or if there's just another version of it that people use, but for those that don't know, it's a website that puts you in a completely random, one-to-one chat room with people, either just text or with webcams too. When I was in my final year of high school, me and my buddies thought it was like the greatest thing ever after we talked three rando girls into flashing us one night. So as thirsty as it sounds, that's all we did for like a whole summer, just chilling in one of our friend's mom's basements and just burning through different people all night. It got to the point where I'd go on Omegle sometimes when I got bored at home, not to talk to girls as such, just to kind of mess around and see who was online. But I don't go anywhere near that site anymore, not after seeing the most messed up thing of my life on there, something that reminded me that the internet is still a pretty dark place sometimes, and that sometimes you can just happen across something seriously messed up, just on accident. So I have my webcam on, and I'm on a roll of just closing chat after chat. Everyone on that night was either a dude playing with themselves, a lonely weirdo, or someone legit mentally deficient, and I was just about to close that browser window out of sheer boredom when I see something that catches my eye. It's a girl, kneeling in a room lit solely with red lights, My first thought is that I might have gotten lucky and that I was in for a little bit of a show. But then I saw the plastic sheet underneath her. Now as crazy as it sounds, I had seen something like that before. When this older woman in a mask had a plastic sheet down and was urinating on whatever the stranger in the chat asked them to. Me and the guys had a good laugh at that one, but it was obvious that the idea was to make us laugh at that time or some other strange interests, but what I ran into that night was most definitely not designed to be humorous. I'm still watching it, wondering who this girl is, why she isn't wearing a mask when she's basically completely uncovered. Whatever was about to happen though, she sure seemed nervous about it, like she was visibly shaking and trying her best to hide her face, not that she was doing a good job of it. It seems really dumb in retrospect, like the whole thing was giving off the worst vibes, but my dumb horny brain has me still thinking that this is some kind of weird fetish, and for some reason, when this masked dude appears on screen, that just cemented it for me. Some kind of weird BDSM thing was about to go down, and I wasn't mad that I was going to be the rando person to get to watch it. The dude walks up to the girl and puts a black bag over her head. She squirms a little, But other than that, I think she's still just nervous. Or maybe she was acting like that as a show for the audience. I mean, heck, maybe the dude liked her to act like that. Who knows? People are weird. The dude then disappears from view before reappearing with a cordless drill. He makes a show of this, tapping a finger on the tip of the drill like a magician would all, this is a real blade type thing, then walks around the back of the girl and grabs her by the head. Only then do I start to realize that this isn't quite what I thought it was and that maybe just maybe I should close the freaking chat before I see something I end up regretting. But there was something about the whole scene, something about the way the guy was acting and how the girl didn't try to run away. It seemed like a setup, like it was designed to freak someone out. Even the red lights were sus, like I remember reading about how old Italian horror movies would tactically use red lights on set to disguise how terrible their fake blood looked. Something about it meant I couldn't look away. So, I was watching as this hulking, bare-chested dude grabs the girl by the head. She's tiny too, and the size difference means his hand is basically wrapped around her entire skull. He then fires the drill up twice to ensure it's working properly. And that's when the girl really starts to panic. 
It was also coincidentally the moment I started to panic too. Either this girl was doing a very good physical acting job or her fear was real. And if her fear was real, it meant the whole thing was real too. She starts flailing and struggling so hard that the monster holding her had to like lock a knee into the small of her back to keep her still. The way they fell, you could basically only see her head and her legs kicking behind them both. Like I said, I was almost certain the whole thing was fake, but the part that made me really doubt that was when what happened to the girl's legs when the guy started to push the whirring, spinning drill into the back of her head. First of all, there was the noise. It was absolutely stomach-churning. The sound of what could easily have been metal on bone just grinding against each other. But that could be faked, right? And there was this horrible mix of screaming and the drill's motor whirring, and the girl like grunting as the pain started to hit. But again, could all be acting at the end of the day. What I'm almost certain you can't fake is the way this girl's legs started to spasm when the guy pinning her down started to really push that drill into her brain. They moved in a way that I don't think I've ever seen before, almost like people act in cartoons when they're being electrocuted. I got this sick feeling in my stomach and I immediately closed the chat window before I saw anything else. The whole thing left me really shaken up. Everyone I've explained what I saw to says they think it was faked too. But then again, I'm almost certain that's because I feed them so much info on how it could have been fake and not really on all the reasons why I think it could have been real. I think I actually just want people to tell me that. Tell me, stop freaking out. You fell for some elaborate prank that'll end up on the internet elsewhere. Because the alternative is just way too messed up for me to quantify and a part of me still does think that I actually did watch a live snuff film that afternoon. I want to tell you guys that I later heard the cops found a body with a drill hole in the back of the head, or even that I read somewhere that it was just a prank, or even like a weird kind of viral marketing campaign or something. But the truth of the matter is, I just don't know. I never heard anyone else talk about the kind of thing I saw on Omegle that day, and I didn't ever go on that site again, so... I didn't give myself a chance to catch a repeat performance, so to speak. I just try and tell myself that what I saw wasn't real, and that it was just an elaborate show to scare random internet strangers. That's what keeps the darker thoughts at bay when I'm reminded of it, and that's what helps me get to sleep at night. Hey friends, thanks for listening. Click that notification bell to be alerted of all future narrations. And if you've got a story, be sure to submit them to my subreddit, r slash let's read official, and give and receive feedback from the community and maybe even hear your story featured on the next video. And join a live stream to catch an invite to my Discord. And if you want to support me even more, grab early access to all future narrations for just $1 a month on Patreon, and maybe even pick up some Let's Read merch on Spreadshirt. And check out the Let's Read podcast where you can hear all these stories in long compilation form and save huge on data, located anywhere you listen to podcasts. Links in the bio below. Thanks so much, friends, and I'll see you again soon.